Notice the market chaos that's erupting with the Dow below 19,000 points in less than a month. It's insanity out there. So what do you do? What's going on? I have the absolute perfect guest today to help us break all of that down and help you make educated choices. All that and so much more coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you move through the crisis that we've already entered, and dare I say it, even thrive on the other side of this mess. And I'd like to welcome you to Coffee with Lynette and our very, very special guest that we have today, Wolf Richter. And anybody that's been watching my work over the years knows that I, I follow him quite closely and use him quite a bit in my work. So to have him here today is very exciting for me to and, and I think it's going to be very valuable to you. He is an author. He is an adventurer. He is a writer. And he's here now. Wolf, I am so happy to have you here. Hi. Hi, Wolf. Here we go. I'm so excited Hi, to Lynette. see you. I am a big fan of yours. Thank you. Thank you. The first thing that I want to ask you is why you do this work. What, pr what prompted you to do this? Well, this started in the last financial crisis. So, uh, <laughs> which is uh, interesting that you're asking me this now, because uh, today I just called this for the first time financial crisis two, what we're looking at. And uh, so uh, back during the last financial crisis, uh, what the Fed was doing, all the bailouts and, and so forth uh, were sort of shocking to me. And, and I decided to, to, to follow this more closely. And then eventually in 2011, I started my blog. And, uh, you know, I have a, a master's in an MBA in finance from way back. And, and we never even discussed the Fed uh, during that program much. I mean, it was just you don't really pay attention to the Fed. And so I got really interested in that. And, uh, and that broadened out into uh, a broader economics and finance uh, website. Well, I, I'm glad that you were inspired to do that because, especially today, the Dow has fallen below 19,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just told all my friends that I'm going through my old drawers and looking for my Dow 20,000 hats and see if I still have them. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really funny. But, but what do you think about all of the Fed action as well as the government action? I mean, is that going to fix this problem? Well, the problem is that we have to shut down part of the economy in order to slow the spread of the coronavirus exactly. enough to where not everyone shows up at the hospital at the same time. And so that's the plan. And if we can do that, you know, if we can successfully keep everybody from showing up at the hospital at the same time, this will, uh, you know, bring mortality rates down quite a bit. And so... Now we have something that I've never seen before in my life. We have an economy that's partially shut down. And I live in, uh, in San Francisco, so we went uh, under lockdown as of Monday. And, uh, you know, you can't, you can't go to work. I live on a busy street. It's dead out there. You can toss a football on it. Um, you know, this, this is something I just haven't seen. During the financial crisis, there was a, a visible slowdown here. I mean, you could see the tourists... Uh, uh, thinned out and the restaurants you could get reservations in and, and now everything's shut down no more tourists the restaurants are largely closed except for for uh, takeout and delivery and yeah the grocery stores are open and hardware stores and some things but uh, other stores are closed so it, it's really dead out there and I you know this is a this is an eerie situation yeah. and it is percolating through the economy and so now we've got a part of the economy shutting down and the financial markets are still open. 
and they're reacting to this violently. And, uh, uh, and, and that makes sense because we've had uh, the biggest, what I call everything bubble in, since I can remember, and it was very fragile, it, it was very vulnerable, and now it's getting hit. So what the Fed is doing, what the government is doing is, is two things, you know, they're trying to somehow keep the financial markets from imploding entirely. So that's the Fed, and, and it's, it has rolled out more programs than it did during the financial crisis, and it's just yes. in a few days, you know. I mean, so the, we're talking about eight days of Fed uh, proposals, and during the financial crisis, you know, it, it took months to come up with all these programs. Now they're, they're already here. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, a lot of it involves allowing people to take on or corporations to take on more debt. What do you think it's going to look like? When we get through this, I mean, we could be looking at 18 months. I was just reading a report last night uh, where they think that it's going to take at least 18 months for a virus, uh, for an antidote to to be created. Yeah, and, and, and you know, we, we, we don't really know. So 18 months sounds reasonable uh, for, for, uh, a, for a drug like that to be developed. Uh, I think the lockdowns won't last that long. Uh, you know, they're going to last longer than a few weeks, maybe. But uh, eventually, when when the curve slows down, bends, you know, when the infection rates go down, we're gradually going to reopen. So it won't. The, the catastrophe won't last that long, but the impact will be there for a long time. And, exactly. You know, we. This is something you don't get over in just two weeks. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is this is even after it's all settled down. You know, I mean. Uh, we're, our, our psychology has changed. You know, yes. We're not thinking about things the same way anymore. And we'll feel that. Exactly. But, I mean, do you feel that among the people you're, you're looking at and talking to? I mean, it feels like, oh, we just get through this a couple of weeks and then we'll be back to normal. <laughs> right. No. And, and normal wasn't that. I mean, we were already heading in this direction between the coronavirus and the oil wars. I mean, I don't even know what they were thinking about do, you know, Saudi Arabia and Russia going into oil wars, oil's down to 20 bucks a barrel right now. Yeah. And, it, you know, my theory is that Saudi Arabia and Russia sort of did that on purpose to, to shut down the uh, U.S. shale oil industry, which has absolutely. taken a huge amount of market share from them. And they're they're being successful right now. I mean, that, <laughs> that shale oil industry will shut down when it runs out of money. It's been cash flow negative all along. And and if if investors don't put in more money, uh, they stop drilling, and that's happening. So uh, that I thought was a very astute move on their part. <laughs> and but their timing really tipped everything over, don't you think? I mean, I'm not yeah. saying they sh should, yeah. shouldn't do it, but the timing of it was horrendous. And I don't know that they thought this through all the way, uh, <laughs> because now they're getting hit too by the consequences. Exactly. And so I'm. I'm not sure how smart that was from their point of view, but it was a long-term play, I think, to to stop losing market share to the to the U.S. fracking industry, and and uh, so you know I can see the desperation in the move that something had to be done about it, but uh, yeah. Well, I have a question that I want to ask you because what I see, I've studied currencies since '87, and this is a currency life cycle issue. And with the value of the fiat currencies, so the government mandated currencies basically having no value let, and with most of the world anchored somewhere near zero, which is why they're really out of ammunition, uh, you know, I mean, I've been looking for something that would usher in and justify a completely new system. And what are your thoughts on that? A reset of the of the global financial system. If we can do it in a planned manner, uh, maybe a good idea. If it happens, and there is this big global reset, it's going to be very messy. And maybe the system that will come out of it will be better. But uh, a global reset. Uh, in in uh, yeah, you, you have to remember that. That in our world, you know, the economy is is based on credit, and so credit means somebody else's, some person's debt is another person's asset. And when you reset that, 
and all these uh, things go haywire and, and collapse and get replaced by something, you know, you're you're looking at at very major uh, economic issues coming out of that that will probably make our current issues look pretty small. So <laughs> I'm not sure that I want to go into to this sort of reset in an unplanned fashion. And of Absolutely. Course, we're, we're kind of headed that way. You know, we we didn't mean to end up in another financial crisis, but here we are. And uh, it didn't take long either. <laughs> Right. Well, I'm not so sure because next year, and maybe they'll change this, but the LIBOR is supposed to go away. And, you know, they've been working really hard on coming up with that new system to replace it, but they haven't really had a whole lot of takers. This could force the issue. What we're going through right now, you know, in some ways it could be cover for what they needed to do anyway and, and force the issue. But how do you see the coronavirus impacting the economy over the longer term? Yeah, so once we get through this lockdown situation and, you know, we, we have the, the health problems behind us mostly, I think uh, we're then left with an exploded bubble. And yep. an exploded everything bubble. So you're talking real estate, you're talking corporate bonds, uh, government bonds, uh, stocks, uh, many asset classes are in there. And uh, it, it, here in the Bay Area, it's it's the startup bubble that, that started imploding last year. I mean, that's not uh, right. from the coronavirus. That started a while ago. I mean, all, all of this did, really. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it just happened to be uh, that the coronavirus came along, you know, and, and but it started and it would have not bet on it. You know, I bet on this, this whole thing coming unglued and, and with a published short position in, on December 30th, you know, and, and uh, uh, because I saw the signs and it was visible that that it was changing and there were underlying uh, sub bubbles that were already imploding. And and uh, so but when we come out of this, that that will all be uh, done, you know, so. Uh, then we're looking at a situation where people are scarred, investors are scarred, uh, people have lot, investors have lost lots of money. Uh, yeah, that's, if you walk into an empty grocery store as an American for the first time in your life, right. you know, that's sort of a shock. You know, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't get over that very quickly. And uh, the kind of lockdown situations we have to deal with that. So, so people are going to come out of this changed, and and I think business decision makers included. So business decisions, finance decisions, investment decisions, and consumer decisions are all going to be made differently than, than today. That's how I see it. I don't really know where this is going, but it's going to be different. Oh, yeah. And, and there could be, I mean, dare I say it, the opportunities that present, because even though the coronavirus is new, currency life cycles and the massive wealth uh, transfer, which is really what's happening in here, this massive wealth transfer presents opportunities for people that have managed to hold on to their purchasing power wealth as these other things get so much cheaper. So, and I, I, you know, I mean, I like to kind of bring up something positive because there's so much negative right now that it really is scary. And, and personally, I feel frankly a bit discombobulated because I too have been planning for it, but a little differently, I didn't short the markets because I'm, I'm more of a long-term strategist. But mm -hmm. it, I mean, it, it's, it's brilliant, except that all you get paid out is dollars. And, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I'm more into the physical gold and silver and food, water, energy, security, barterability. I mean, that's really my mantra and that's what I've been doing you know, preparing for myself. Yeah. But but if you're holding your wealth, then what do you think about the opportunities that are going to present down the road? Well, you know, the the problem investors have when the opportunities finally are there, generally they're out of money. They've lost so much money, they no longer have any liquidity left and they can't buy. So if you have liquidity or if you have assets uh, that are still worth something, then you can take uh, advantage of opportunities when they do come along, and I totally agree with that. And and uh, you know I'm I'm uh, 
in terms of my financial assets, you know, I'm mostly now in cash, I'm totally in cash and, and treasury securities. Uh, yeah, I, I, I covered my short position some, a few days ago and uh, uh, I don't, you know, so if you, if you have a, a stash of gold, you know, you did very well the last uh, eight or 10 months, you know, it was a phenomenally uh, a good place to be. Uh, it's gotten hit pretty hard in the last few days, but it's still, you know, well, well, you know, and, and so, yeah, the, there's some assets that that were beaten down earlier, you know, a few years ago that are now uh, holding, you know, and 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 it's important to have those in a, in a crisis like this. Absolutely. But you know what I found uh, really telling because you're right, everybody is selling everything to raise cash and it, it's kind of indiscriminate. But when you look at the um, the percentage drop in say stocks or say in well bond yields are rising again that's we'll talk about that in a second but as compared to spot gold spot gold has fallen the least mm -hmm. because you may be forced to sell it to raise money for a margin call but that's the one thing that you don't want to sell except even if it's a contract it's a contract right yeah, and yeah, our stock market can go down 12% in one day, and we've seen that, you know, and, and so gold went down 12% in, in eight days, and uh, so it sounds relatively mild, and it, it went down after it had a huge run-up, and so it was sort of expected, and uh, I don't I don't think that's a, a long-term move, you know, I, I, I think uh, uh, not, nothing goes up forever, you know, you do have... Uh, uh, profit taking, especially in, in in financial contracts like futures contracts and so forth. So uh, yeah, that that was sort of expected that it would do that. Uh, I you know if if you own uh, real estate and if you bought it at the right price, uh, you know you, you're going to take uh, a bath a little bit. You know, but but generally real estate, you know, if you if you bought it at the right price, you'll be okay. Uh, if you asset. bought it, yeah, if you bought it real recently, you know, during the in the last few years, you know, you may have a hard time with it. But uh, if you bought it a long time ago, you know, it'd be fine. If you have productive um, activities like company, uh, uh, especially a company dealing with uh, with actually producing something, you know, mm -hmm. these these are good things to have. You know, I have my little company; it's doing well, and uh, uh, so. You know, there, there's a lot of, as you said, you know, there's a lot of positive going on. Uh, you just have to focus on it. And, you know, I feel I feel for people that that are stuck with their uh, stock portfolios and they'll watch them uh, go down. I've been through this before. I've uh, this is my fourth uh, stock market crash. Yeah, exactly. I've been out of it now. And and uh, so I, I have not had any exposure to it. Uh and I had not had any exposure to the last one, but I had to the first two. And so I know what that feels like. And 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 it changes your your attitude about things. You're going if to, you, if you can go out and spend, you know, which you can't right now, but if you can, right. uh, you can spend less because you lost, you know, you lost 40 percent of what you thought you had just like that. <laughs> well, that's that nominal price and they always talk about nominally speaking so people get married to numbers and they mm -hmm. before this they lost all sight of value what is value at this time is different no it, it's never really different but what do you think is going to happen with all the money printing the new money the trillions i mean look they're, they're gonna have to start universal income they're gonna have to they're sending everybody checks and that's going to end up being, you know, what's temporary always ends up, or frequently, I should say, ends up being permanent. But it's the value of the dollar when it's just given and easy to create. Uh, you know, I mean, that is my personal concern since officially we have, you know, 3.89 cents in value left out of the original dollar. All of this new money, which uh, they have to do, they they can't let people, they can't grow the homeless population. They're going to have to send them checks. Uh, so last time it was bailing out the big guys. This time they're going to have to bail out the little guys. But um, what do you think of the possibility of that turning into a hyperinflationary event? 
Well, we saw the reaction in the long-term treasury market. You know, that uh, 30-year treasury spiked by over one percentage point despite the huge rate cuts from the Fed. And there's exactly. a worry now. And there's a worry now that, uh, you know, that 30-year money you've got locked in there, you're going to get killed by inflation. And exactly. uh for long-term bondholders, that's a that's a, a dreadful thought. You know, you you're losing your you know. I mean, you get your money back, uh, but after 30 years, but the purchasing power of that money will be so reduced that uh, the yield you got from that investment doesn't doesn't cover it anymore by by far. You know, so you may lose. You know, we always lose about 20 uh, 20 or so percent every every decade recently. Now we're going to look at much further, faster losses uh, than that, probably as you pointed out. And and uh, hyperinflation, I'm not sure we're going to we're going to get that far, but we're we're going to see, uh, I think, a major increase in inflation when, once this is over. You know, and and uh, and, and initially, you know, we, we're going to have price spikes because of scarcity and, yes. and other issues like that. But once yes. we get beyond that, uh, you know. I, I, as you said, and and especially if this, uh, if if sending out checks to people, you know, if that continues, if that's, uh, yeah, then then we will get much higher consumer price inflation than than we've had in the past, and yeah. that would be very destructive for for a lot of assets you have. Oh yeah, well, modern money theory. Let's just print and print and print. Yeah. But you know, unfortunately, I I don't see the alternative. You know, I I mean, I feel like they have to do it. Mm -hmm. Because and they put a I think this morning they announced a mor moratorium on mortgage payments and rent payments. But, you know, it's so it's like a trickle effect, too, isn't it? Or a domino effect. Yeah. And, you know, the, when it comes to bailouts, I'd rather have the little people get the bailout, like you said, than <laughs> than the big people. And and so there's a lot to be said for sending out checks that amount to a trillion dollars than uh, sending you know four trillion dollars to the corporate world to bail it out, and well, Boeing. Do, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say because on that point, Boeing is asking for a bailout now. But if you look at their pension fund in 2017, they funded it with Boeing stock. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, an amazing uh, thing, you know, and and uh, and Boeing, uh, yeah, Boeing stocks down over seventy percent. So, it, you know, the, the decisions that companies are making uh, at the expense of of their workers and others, you know, it, it sometimes it's just astounding. <laughs> yeah. I'd agree. Uh, do you know Starbucks announced a buyback this morning, a stock buyback? Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll see how that works. When they announce it, they don't necessarily have to do it. But if, they have, if they have enough cash, uh, yeah, so they're going to uh, run into a revenue problem too. So they're, they're going to have expenses. And so the cash is still going out. Uh, they're still going to pay uh, employees. And they still have rents on their stores. And uh, they have a, a collapse in revenues. So I don't know how much longer uh, they can use the corporate cash before they have to go out and borrow money to to just survive, you know. And exactly. in, and in these, I mean, it's easy to announce a cash buyback, hoping to prop up your shares. Uh, but when you're in a liquidity crisis, the last thing you're going to do is to to waste scarce cash on share buybacks. So uh, I think share buyback, I mean, there may be a few companies. Apple has a lot of cash. You know, there's some companies that have a lot of cash that can survive just about anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they may do some share buybacks, but uh, other companies, uh, it will end for them, you know. And, and uh, so I, I don't, you know, maybe they can do a, a little bit of share buyback, buying back their shares, you know, and just to, to sort of prop up their shares. But I, I don't think there's going to be any significant buybacks out there. Well, you know, that was already declining, but maybe for some of our viewers that don't understand what a, what a share buyback is, and even going back to, since you really, it caught your interest at the last crisis, there are some things that have happened between then 
and now, like uh, share buyback is a way to return capital to investors because they're, the companies are going in and buying their shares on the open market. And a lot of companies used a lot of debt to buy back their shares. And even if they use the cash instead, they probably wish they didn't because a lot of companies today don't have enough income to cover expenses. We've got a lot of zombie companies, mm -hmm. you know, out there that we're using debt to buy that back. And the other thing, so buybacks were a lot of what pushed these markets into completely severely overvalued levels. Mm -hmm while the insiders were actually selling their shares. Right. So the recent numbers uh, have been around half a trillion dollars in share buybacks a year, going back a few years. So they're sometimes over mm -hmm. a little under. Half a trillion dollars in new money that comes into the stock market. So this is money that was borrowed or, or coming from operations. So it's, it, it is new money for the stock market. And these shares, unlike other shares, so when I buy shares, they sit in my account and, and eventually I'll sell them. And But when share buybacks occur, these shares are, are either canceled or or become treasury stock and they're not reappearing in the stock market. So they're never sold. And uh, this has an incredible uh, uh, supportive power for, for the stock market. Half a trillion dollars is a lot you know, per year. So uh, when you pull that out from under the stock market, uh, and for some companies, it was a huge thing. You know, other companies hadn't been been that involved in it, but some companies did a lot of that. And when you pull that out, like Boeing, you know, Boeing stopped doing share buybacks last year, and its stock just collapsed. There was nothing. There was no no buyers left right. <laughs> at these prices. You know, you had to go way down to to find the next buyer. And and this is what's happening. You know, we've gotten so used to these companies buying back their own shares at the at at any price, really. And and now they don't, and and the shares just just flop right through these limits. Exactly, you know the other, and uh, it used to be easy to go on to the Nasdaq website, and I could put any stock in, and there was a beautiful little bar chart that showed me what the insiders were buying and what the insiders were selling, and they gave you this lovely list, and it was so graphic and it was so perfect. Well, they don't do that anymore because I don't think they really wanted you to know. But they also, because what it looked like, honestly, was that as the stock was rising, the company was taking on debt to buy back the shares at the same time that the insiders, those at the very top of the pyramid in the corporation, were selling into that. Mm -hmm. But the share buybacks would hide that selling. Also, you could look and see who really owned the shares were typically institutional investors mm -hmm. that were buying shares on, you know, a normal person that doesn't know what's going on, their behalf, you know, so that's who's owning this stuff. Right. Now, what's interesting, too, is, is when uh, uh, executives announce that they're actually buying shares. And uh, so they're often getting loans from the company and they're pledging the shares as shares. collateral. Yeah. Oh, my God, so, yes. You know, I have seen that blow up during the financial crisis. And there's a company I used to work with, you know, and, and uh, that's what they've done. I mean, they have the, employ the top employees and executives uh, borrow large amounts of money and uh, from the company to invest it in shares. And then the stock completely collapsed. And uh, those loans were forgiven. The only collateral was the shares. So the company got those worthless shares back and the loans were forgiven. And there was not even any kind of revolt. I mean, it's among shareholders, you know, among the other shareholders, you know, and, uh, no, no one uh, got fired. There was no pressure on, on any on the board to, to relieve the CEO and all the others. You know, it, the, the stock just collapsed, became a penny stock. And and all those loans were forgiven and, and you know, the company got in real trouble. So, you know, when I see uh, people go out there, executives and the media hypes how they bought, you know, one million dollars worth of shares of their own company. And uh, through the back door, they got a loan from the company to do that. I just cringe, you know, I'm not, that's just market manipulation, this kind of stuff. Absolutely. But taking that one step further, because a lot of those executives also used their stock shares as collateral for bank loans. Mm -hmm. 
So when they're talking about how well capitalized, which is which is a lot of why zombie companies, companies that really can't meet their expenses over a period of time and, and pay their interest payments and principal payments, so the banks keep loaning them money. I mean, this is not this is not even marginally over. I think we're right in the beginning of the real financial crisis. Yeah, and that's why the Fed is reacting so strongly. I mean, this is far more, far faster than during the financial crisis. I mean, they're they're aware that this is now triggering the biggest uh, thing that anybody's ever seen, and and yeah, yeah and, and and it's not the yeah the true extent of it is not known. The banks were pretty well capitalized for you know a downturn, but this is not a downturn. You know, this is a. No. This, major issue and so no bank is capitalized to deal with this stuff and no but i i really i know that's what the rhetoric is out there but when you look at the level of speculative derivatives which is higher than it was in 2008 in the fdic insured mm -hmm. banks mm -hmm. you know um i don't i never really bought that garbage. And the stress tests were just for us to feel comfortable that the bank was capitalized. But when you look at the leverage ratios, they're not so, and then you look at their derivative exposure, which is derivatives are just big bets based mm -hmm. upon the price action of the underlying. Um, I don't think the banks are as well capitalized as, as everybody wants you to believe. So that could lead to bail-ins, and very yeah. well may. I mean, the, the the thing that everybody counted on was a, a downturn. Yeah, you know, just a regular downturn. A little recession. A regular routine recession, yeah. And uh, that's not what we got. So now all bets are off. And, uh, you know, the, the derivative situation uh, probably will get our attention when more of it bubbles out. Um, this, as you point out, this is huge, you know, and a lot of the underlying assets have, have collapsed in price. And of course, a derivative generally has two sides. So somebody's making money, the other person is losing money. And and on, on a trade like that, so it, it could very well be that it's not as bad. But even, I mean, the numbers are so gigantic, even if it's a relatively small move, uh, it, it has a huge impact. It does. Now, I would, I know you've written a lot about this. Uh, the ETF market, which is also a derivative, and the mismatch in maturity in a lot of these things, and the herding mentality. Can you comment on that? And what are your thoughts about that? I know you have a lot of thoughts on that, actually. Yeah, so I'm going to distinguish you a little bit. Uh, the uh, mutual funds, uh, open-ended mutual funds, especially those dealing with illiquid assets such as bonds, they are a real problem. And I have been uh, uh, ranting and raving about that for a long time. Uh, a number of those uh, open mutual funds blew up during the financial crisis and you know, became big class action lawsuits and individual lawsuits. And, and many brokerage firms had their own bond funds uh, that mm -hmm. including Charles Schwab and, and others. Yeah. And uh, we have learned nothing. <laughs> you know, uh, open end bond mutual funds should not exist. Maybe treasury securities, okay. Uh, open end bond mutual funds that hold only treasury securities, okay, maybe. But it takes sometimes weeks to trade a bond. And uh, there are many bonds that don't trade at all. They're sitting in some portfolio and there's, there are no trades and nobody knows what they're worth. So how, how are you going to price them? And you can't price them to, to mark to market because there's no market for, for this particular bond. Exactly. So uh, there is some kind of fantasy value in the fund. The fund gets redemptions. So now they have to sell that bond, but there's no market for it. So now they have to sell it at a big discount, the fire sell price, to find a hedge fund or some some other outfit that will buy that. And, you know, the, the investors in the mutual fund can get out with the click of a mouse. They can get out on a daily basis, but you can't sell the assets uh, on a daily basis. And and this causes a collapse. And the run on the fund, uh, on, on these types of funds, is, is a very dangerous thing. And yeah. And it's the you know, the first move advantage. So if you get if you're the first one out the door, you, you're the lucky one. 
And if you if you stick to it, you can lose 60 or 70 percent in what is considered a conservative investment. And I hate those funds. You, you mean know? like a money market fund? <laughs> well, they're, they're, they put the fees and the gates in there, so you can't. So you would choose not to liquidate. Yeah, I mean, and and, and the ETFs are a little different, so I, I don't want to throw them in the same uh, ballpark because they're traded, and so their their prices adjust uh, while trading, and so so they get their adjustment in price uh, on a minute by minute basis in the market, and and they can be very risky too, but you'll see it right there. Uh, but, uh, you know, bond, bonds are great to hold uh, long term outright. I like bonds. I think they're uh, in, a, in a good company. You know, they're good investments. And sometimes when, when there's a big blow up, you can pick up some, some bonds for a very low price and get a really good yield and, and get paid you know, when they mature. So they're, they're, they're good opportunities there. But good lordy, <laughs> bond mutual funds, I just, uh, to me, yeah, they're just risky. They're just really, they sound conservative, but they're incredibly risky. Uh, they're incredibly risky. And and um, you're probably a bit bigger fan of, and uh, obviously we're, we're just doing a big blanket, mutual funds or ETFs. But a lot of the ETFs are not sitting on any cash. And they're not sitting on any cash because they don't really have to pay you, the investor, and they can give whatever they've got in there to the um, authorized participants. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, so there could be a huge liquidity mismatch and a lot of leverage in there too. But, you know, on the way up, if they all decided to buy Apple, well, that pushed the price of the stock up really high, right? Well, if they all decide to sell Apple, that's going to plummet it too. So, you know, the way that, that they're structured is kind of the same. You've got a bunch of them that, that are structured really similarly, and that creates the herding. Do you think that could possibly be part of what we're seeing in the volatility in the markets? Yeah, definitely. I, I think that's part of the reason why we have this historic volatility. I mean, we've never had this kind of thing where one day stocks go up 9% and the next day they go down 12% and then they go up 9% and they go down 10%. You know, it, it's just... Uh, just a, just a neck-breaking volatility. We've never had this. During the financial oh. crisis, the most we had was three days in a row of over 2% moves. Yeah. Now we've had a series of days. I think we're now in day number eight with moves uh, over over something like 5%. I mean, it's just, I, I mean, just astounding the kind of volatility we have. I have never seen anything like this either. And, you know, like you... You know, I was there. I was a new stockbroker at um, Black Monday. I was in the markets just a year, so I was a baby. How did, how did that fill in that? <laughs> that actually, that was a career-making day because I didn't understand the markets, so I cut my teeth on bonds and debt, and so um, everybody else was physically, literally, and I'm not exaggerating, under their desks. Stockbrokers were not taking phone calls, which I think is happening now too. But so that actually, I ha happened to have a client who owned a savings and loan in Crockett, Texas. <laughs> and <laughs> right, it was kind of, uh, what I had been doing for them was uh, buying treasuries and then selling calls against the treasury. So really conservative mm -hmm. piece, you know, so I never did any stock trading with them. But these guys, they had, he had me on the uh, speakerphone squawk box in the center of the conference room because none of their oil wild catters and all those guys that are very, you know, I mean, those guys take a lot of risk, but they couldn't get a hold of their brokers and nobody had a personal computer. So that was a lot of fun for me, I got to say. Count me into that group that couldn't get a hold of their broker, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because I, I uh, on that Monday afternoon, I was in Oklahoma at that time, you know, and, and I tried to call my broker to buy some stuff mm -hmm. and I could never get through. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, it, it's uh, those were the good old times, you know, where when something really went haywire, you were just stuck. You couldn't even make any changes. <laughs> yeah. Well, then after that, they did the plunge protection team and all of that. But maybe we can find something positive here to end this interview with. Although I could keep talking to you forever because you're just brilliant, and you know, it's just so great to have this conversation. But you know, can you, what do you think people should do right now? 
Any thoughts? Well, uh, so if you own stocks, you know, and you have a financial advisor, uh, and you paid your financial advisor. <laughs> to, to, I'm not sure that's positive. You know, then uh, I think you should listen to your financial advisor. Um, but if you don't have one, um, you know, uh, it is now pretty late to move out of stocks, you know, because you've already lost so much. It may not be too late, but it's, you know, you've already, you've already gotten hit hard. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, solid at real assets are good. Uh, I, I think if you are in, if you have liquid assets uh, that are holding the value short term, uh, yeah, there will be opportunities out there to pick some stuff up um, and, you know, be prepared to do that. Uh, you know, if you have gold, hang on to it. If you have, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if you have, if you own part of a, a lumbo operation, you know, that kind of thing, you, you can you can tough things out. Right. Um, tangibles. Yeah. You're talking tangibles. To real stuff, tangibles. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not big into uh, hoarding food and those kinds of things. I, I live in earthquake country, so we're all prepared for a, a major issue here. So, you know, so that's that, a good point. Yeah, I mean, but it's important in general to do that. Uh, yeah, we're, we're told day in and day out, you know, before even this coronavirus came along, you know, we, we're going to be on our own for a week, you know, at least, and won't have any water, won't have anything for a week if there's a major earthquake and maybe longer, you know, so we're, so that that's, I think that's the minimum for every household. You need to have, uh, you need to be able to get through some tough times without being able to go to the store. And, uh, you know, and, and I think keeping your spirits up is important too. You know, you, you, it, it's get, if you're in lockdown and, and you're in, in your, your place and you can't get out, uh, and I've heard that it's not as bad in the Bay Area, but in Europe, in some places, they don't let you get out of the house. Right. You know, it's very important to, to somehow keep up your spirits and, uh, you know, retain uh, the connection with your family and, and your friends and and and, and uh, hang on to what's, uh, what's valuable in real life. I think that's mm -hmm. important. Think we're going to have a baby boom? It has been suggested. <laughs> so uh, there's already been a name out there, and it's uh, going to be the quarantines in 12 <laughs> years. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, you know, when you look at this stuff, you, you think um, – yeah, it makes sense. That could be a baby boom. <laughs> well, yeah, if you can't go anywhere, you know, and you're... What else you is know? there to do, you know? <laughs> exactly. I was there, we were trying to figure this out, but I remember the blackout that happened in New York. Um, gosh, it was probably in the 60s. And there was a lot of babies born after that, <laughs> nine <laughs> months later. So uh, you, we, we could be looking at a bit, which, which is really a good thing. We'll because unfortunately, I think we're also looking at a huge amount of depopulation. Yeah. So um, we'll we'll need to jumpstart. You know, for those people that are out there, I mean, this is not likely to be the absolute end of the world. But, you know, I think that this is my personal feeling, and I've said this right along, is that the system that we knew it died in 2008. And all of these experiments that the central bankers have done since then has only made, it, it, it kind of kept it on life support, but made the system so much more fragile. So when we get this black swan event, I mean, seriously, I, I did not see a global pandemic. I didn't. It's true. And I don't know anybody that actually, or to, well, there might be some people that saw it coming. But... My mantra has been for a long time, food, water, energy, security, community, barterability, wealth preservation, shelter. These are things that we need no matter what's happening in the economy. I'm glad in places like San Francisco that people are more uh, prepared because I know that this blindsided a lot mm -hmm. of people. And... As scary as it's been, even for me, on those measures, I am prepared. So I was even able to give somebody some toilet paper. 
<laughs> Seriously, yeah. that needed toilet paper, but I had toilet paper, no problem. So I think that, you know, right now we have to hunker down, but when we get through this, I think this needs to be a warning for people that they need to be prepared for any eventuality. Now, would you like to share anything else, how to get a hold of you, your work, or anything else for our viewers? Although all the links will be listed so they can easily access you and your fantastic work. Yeah, so everything I do is on my website, wolfstreet.com. And uh, I also have a, a podcast I work on occasionally, but now I've, with this uh, collapse going on, I've been too busy to, to put it together. Uh, so everything uh, you want to see that I do is on wolfstreet.com. We have a incredibly vibrant comment section. Uh, so with all kinds of comments from all over the place. Uh, so, and, and, and I moderated myself, spent a lot of time doing it. So it's very polite and, um, and nothing shocking being said in it. Good. Yeah, we're very conscious of that here as well. Well, I cannot thank you enough for coming on Coffee with Lynette today. And I hope I can have you back because I have a feeling we'll have lots more to talk about. Maybe tomorrow. I mean, things are just <laughs> happening so quickly. Yeah, thank you, Lynette, for having me. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And if you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of Wolf. But if you have any questions, you know, we're here to be of service. And we're all, I think, all of us in the community, because that's what this is. This is building community. And, and that's really important. This is not, you know, everybody for themselves. This is we need to just come together. We need to be smart about our actions. You know, if you can just cocoon in your home, that's the best thing to do. Next week, I'm starting to film from home. Uh, and that's it for me. And I've already narrowed my world a whole lot. But that's what we all have to do because we want to not get it, not get the coronavirus ourselves, but we certainly don't want to give it to anybody either. So with that, keep in mind, financial shields are made of physical metal, not promises. And it's so important to CYA, cover your assets. Until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.